Well, how are y'all doing tonight? So 50 years of ATA. And I know General McNabb asked how many of you were first timers here. I wasn't able to see how many of you stood and I won't applaud for you, but I will say welcome to the ATA family. Uh, as a life member, I have experienced ATA, gosh, a dozen or so times easy. I've been on this stage in several command positions and what I wanna say is welcome to the family. And it did feel like a family reunion when I stepped out of the vehicle and uh, hit the portico of the building because Duncan and Rusty and the whole family were there to meet us. So Marianne, thank you for the introduction. Steve, congratulations and, and welcome to ATA again. Uh, I was actually prepared to give about 45 minutes of remarks and I know I'm a little late and it's my fault because it wasn't a local, it's an out and back and I was in the seat and we didn't account for the 150 knot headwind we had at 41,000 feet. So I'm gonna edit along the way, if you don't mind. So I have really deep roots in air mobility. Really deep roots. I grew up at Lodges Air Force Base. I grew up under the final approach and the initial departure of KB-50s. I remember the sound of those engines as they roared over my bedroom. Day and night, and day and night. I remember riding to McGuire on a C-124. They called it a shaky for a good reason. When the engineer would try to sink the motors, the whole airplane shook. I remember the 17-hour sortie on a 130, droning over the Atlantic looking for a downed sailor when I was space A, headed to McGuire. So I do have some deep roots, some really deep roots. In fact, my mother would tell you that she lost me to the Air Force when I was two years old. I will not tell the story, but she would if she were here. So I do have a whole bunch of historical material, but Duncan used that. It was all about the 834th Air Division, about Bagger and General Moore and what they did in Vietnam. But what most of us forget about what they did in Vietnam as, as, as tactical airlifters, and that's what they were, and they're very proud of it. They had the motto, anything, anytime, anywhere. What most of us don't know is that 138 mobility airmen lost their lives in that conflict. We lost 70 airplanes delivering equipment and personnel to every corner of Vietnam. And so 50 years ago, when they got together in Las Vegas to celebrate the brotherhood that had grown up in the crucible of battle, they were celebrating all the heroism of their friends. It was many years later when General Fogelman found himself challenged to unite our command. I grew up a tanker guy. I remember the patches, Young Tiger, Gucci, nobody kicks ass without tanker gas, nobody. But I also remember the Big Mac guys with the plastic spoons. <laughs> I remember the Little Mac guys that would have nothing to do with them. I'm a tack airlifter, in the dirt. Yeah, okay. But I grew up, I moved on. And what General Fogelman did for this command with this association was to say, we must unite the tribes. We must find a way for all mobility airmen to be proud of being mobility airmen. So that when somebody says nobody kicks ass without tanker gas, there's a voice in the background that says anything, anytime, anywhere. Global mobility, connecting the world. That's what you do. That's what you do for the joint force. That's what you do for the nation. And so I applaud General Fogelman's vision in retooling the association. And I applaud Bagger's willingness to come along and Bob's willingness to come along because they could have said no. Well, maybe not to General Fogelman. <laughs> maybe not to General Fogelman. That's why we're here, to celebrate you to celebrate what you do. That's why the Hall of Fame exists. That's why when 
General Cross is inducted later, will celebrate another mobility hero, a person who went above and beyond. Like John Levito, that celebrated airman who wore the Medal of Honor for most of his life, because he was willing to throw himself on a magnesium flare in an airplane at night. Now, some of you are saying, well, that ain't all that big a deal. His fellow crewmen had pulled the pin out of that flare. When you pull the pin out of a magnesium Mark 24 flare, you have 20 seconds until it ignites. For those of you who question his valor, two million candle power. He didn't flinch. He pitched himself over that flare to save the other eight airmen on that airplane, and then he wrestled himself to the door and threw it out. And within a couple of seconds, it ignited. He put his life at risk. I don't think you can train somebody to do that. You can hope they will when it's time. So he didn't train to do what he did. He reacted to save his fellow airmen. And I think that spirit lives in every one of you. In fact, that's all been used. That's been used. I'm going to tell you some stories about mobility airmen. Young men and women who were doing their job when they were called. Senior Airman Matt Snyder and Airman First Class Jeff McGee were deployed to Bagram several months ago. They were loading their C-17 like they've loaded their C-17 a couple of hundred times. The aerial porters, those box kickers that we all depend on, another tribe, by the way, had built a bridge of two loaders. McGee noticed that the driver of the second loader was behaving erratically. So he opened the window to the cab and what he smelled was exhaust. And so he reacted quickly. He asked the guy in the, in the first loader to shut the engine down. He pulled the young man out of the cab of the second loader. By the time he got him to the ground, he could no longer stand. In fact, he collapsed at McGee's feet. Snyder went onto the airplane, grabbed an oxygen bottle, brought it out, and they started giving oxygen treatment to the young man who had collapsed. They eventually revived him. They got him to the hospital at Bagram. He spent four days in the hospital. The respiratory therapists and doctors who treated him said he was suffering from asphyxiation and cyanide poisoning. Didn't know loaders had cyanide in the exhaust. And he most certainly would have died had they not acted. A month ago, right here in Dallas, an airplane took off bound for Baltimore. On that airplane were five mobility airmen. About 45 minutes out, a 74-year-old man sitting in the center seat leaned over to his wife and said he felt faint. Lucky for him, seated next to him was Staff Sergeant April Hanoso. She happens to be an aeromedical evacuation technician. She asked him how he felt. She asked, asked him how, you know, how his, his faculties were. And as he tried to talk to her, he passed out. Senior Airman Hanoso, with her own strength, picked him up out of his seat, laid him down in the aisle, and started giving chest compressions. When the crew asked if there was anyone else on the airplane who had medical training, Major Carolyn Statesney, Captain Justin Stein, Lieutenant Laura Maldonado, Tech Sergeant Robert Kirk, and Tech Sergeant Edgar Ramirez, all sprang into action. The three flight nurses grabbed all the equipment they could on the airplane, oxygen, portable defibrillator, and they rushed to Airman Honoso's side. 
They started an IV, they cleared the gentleman's airway, and about the time they thought they were going to revive him, his pulse stopped for a second time. They deployed the defibrillator, they did all the things they needed to do, and he regained consciousness as the crew executed an emergency arrival and landing at Little Rock. I'm told this week the gentleman's wife called one of the flight nurses and said he had had a massive heart attack. And the cardiologist who treated him at Little Rock General Hospital said he would most certainly be dead if they hadn't reacted when they were called. And let me stop with one more story. This June, actually July, we watched as the remains of 55 soldiers who perished at places like Unsan and Chosin Reservoir were repatriated to the United States. We all saw the C-17 crews, we saw the crew members, we saw the honor guard. The people we didn't see were Major Carissa Dini, Tech Sergeant Chad Geronimo, Airman First Class Lily Crawford, they were the team from the aerial port that arranged for all of the flags, for all of the coordination, for 3,000 people to witness in person the repatriation of American remains that have lied in the Korean hillsides for 65 years. We all know who the people were from US Forces Korea, from 7th Air Force, from Combined Forces Command. We know that the Vice President greeted those remains at Hickam. Most of you don't know that it was three mobility airmen quietly working in the background that made it all happen. So this week, over the next several days, you're going to hear the names of a lot of award winners. You're going to hear the names of a lot of people who have done extraordinary things. Look around the room. You are all extraordinary. The work you do every day helps define this nation. Because there isn't any place we won't go to defend freedom and liberty. There isn't any place you can't take us that allows us to do our mission. Everything that defines global mobility is defined by you. It's defined by the professional men and women of our Air Force, of our Air Mobility Command, and of our United States Transportation Command that make this all possible. I'm fond of saying you make the impossible look easy. In fact, you make the impossible look too easy. And so I'm kind of glad I am where I am, and I'm sure as hell glad I came from where I came from. Because when I watch the joint force move, when I see the orders books and the deployment orders for units all over this country and all over this world, I actually know how hard that is. But I got to tell you, I swell up with a little pride when I see those orders books. When I know that a KC-135 crew from Fairchild is going to be doing their work. When I know that a C-17 crew from McGuire or Dover or Travis or McCord or Charleston is going to be delivering those soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, or coast guardsmen to their mission on some remote corner of the world. I know when I get a report about a wounded soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, that he or she will be in the best hands that medical science and aeromedical evacuation art have to offer. And so I'm incredibly proud of you. I'm incredibly proud of what you do every day. And I know that with the heroes and heritage of this organization, there's a bright sun right over the next horizon. So thank you for what you do every single day. Now, I am told 
that there are a handful of microphones in the audience. I also know that I was late, and I've asked the guys behind the stage that as soon as the Secretary of the Air Force is here, that I get a giant hook, and I'm going to depend on Chris Kelly to deliver the hook. How are you? Good. I'm going to collect my cards up. Is that okay? Because my speech Sir, writer you, really likes it. if you don't mind, I'll get them for you. But no? All right. I'll let you get your own. Could we bring the house lights up? Uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, folks right there in the aisles ready to uh, ask questions. And so please raise your hands and the mic runners will run you a mic. And if you'll wait for a second for them to get that to you, then please identify yourself and ask your question. And don't be shy. And don't make me ask the first question. Because if you don't ask me questions, I have to ask these guys on the front row questions. And that's never fulfilling. Come on, somebody break the ice. It's easy. All right, Chris. Come on, question. <laughs> it's like, oh. No, I, uh, sir, uh, obviously you and the chairman uh, have, uh, have, are, are in the throes of some of the uh, biggest reorganizations and, and, and challenges that we've seen probably in the last decade. Uh, new national military strategies, uh, well, lots of other things that are impacting uh, the nation's ability to go out and do what it needs to do militarily. Uh, I would ask you what the biggest challenge is, uh, but there's probably too many to mention. What is the one thing that you and the chairman are really, really focused on uh, the most uh, to try to bring us to where we need to be in the next uh, five to ten years? Thanks, Chris. Well. This, this is going to sound a little Washington-centric, and I don't mean it to, but when the chairman and I came in a little over two and a half years ago, two things struck us. One, we treated almost all of the challenges in the world as regional challenges. The second was that in the absence of a strategy that actually defined where we wanted to take the organization, it, we could sort of take any path we wanted. And, and of course we knew at that point that the administration that had nominated us into our positions had about 18 to 20 months time to run. So we set upon two parallel um, objectives. One was to actually write a national military strategy, to define the world not as we wished it was, but how we saw it. And what we saw was that Russia and China were the pacing threats that Iran and North Korea were going to be a problem for some time to come, and the work we were doing in Iraq and Afghanistan at the time must persist because global terrorism wasn't going to go away. But if you remember, at that point in time, it wasn't actually fashionable to talk about Russia and China. In fact, when I stood for my first confirmation hearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator McCain asked me straight up what I thought the most significant threats to our national security work. And I listed them in the order I basically just gave them to you. And about two weeks later, so did General Dunford. So he said, we have to have a military strategy that defines the world as it is. And so we crafted that strategy in the closing months of the Obama administration and are today retooling it a little bit, not a lot, to match the national security strategy and the national defense strategy that have just recently been published. But as we did that work, we started asking hard questions like, who should really be in charge of planning? So answer this one question. Which combatant commander is most concerned about China? Most of you would say, well, that's the PACOM commander. Except China has a border with CENTCOM. China can actually strike the continental United States with intercontinental ballistic missiles. So now NORTHCOM's interested, SOCOM's interested, STRATCOM's interested. So how do we integrate all those plans in a way that makes sense from a military perspective and present them to our political leadership? Point of fact, the process we had when we got there was exactly the opposite. Combatant commanders, in the case of China, PACOM, would present their plan to OSD absent any consultation with the Joint Staff, with a list of forces that may or may not exist to be employed for that plan. We said, that won't work. So we set the chairman up and the Joint Staff up as what we call the global integrator. And we have the combatant commanders react to a global plan for the problem sets that are in their AORs. 
and it gets vetted by the joint staff before it's presented as an option to our political leadership. And then it goes through the normal process of being evaluated. That doesn't sound all that hard, except you have to completely retool how the joint staff works to make it happen. And so we've been about that process for the last 24 months. Yes, sir. Sir, we do have time for one more question okay. and then an award, and then we'll get the, the secretary awesome. out on the, the stage. So, uh, young, does someone have a question here? All right, right here. Yes, sir. Right here on the right, uh, General Selva. Good day, General Selva. Can you make any comments on what you foresee as the future with the Space Force as it comes online and how <laughs> mobility and every feeling would work into that? Yeah, great and it's question. It's nice to see you again, sir. Great question. So I, I've got to decide in Star Trek, what were the mobility guys wearing? <laughs> right, so, so the guy that worked the transporter beam, the engineer, last I remember those were red. Some would say they're expendable. Sorry for the joke. Um, and my wife would say, don't do that because you're not that funny. Um, so the Space Force, we've been given direction and we're moving out quick. Uh, the Joint Chiefs are unanimous that we should form a combatant command for space, and that when that command has the authorities, responsibilities, and, and a commander can be held accountable for the defense of our space constellation and the architecture that it represents, then we'll be ready for a space force. We're gonna to try to do all that in parallel. We've got a very aggressive timeline. We intend to have a legislative proposal to the Congress in the winter of 19 to establish the space force in early 20. Now, truth be told, the Constitution says only the Congress can establish a branch of the armed services. And so we will present the Congress with a legislative proposal and they'll tinker with it as Congress will tinker with those things that, uh, that drive our military. And we'll come out the other end with whatever that force is gonna look like. Our proposal is that we make it an entire service, whole and, and undivided. What comes out the other end of the process, I'm not sure. I don't know how it will affect mobility, but, but most of you know space affects mobility every day. I mean, I flew an RNAV arrival into Dallas-Fort Worth a little over an hour and a half ago. If it weren't for GPS, we wouldn't have RNAV. By the way, if it weren't for GPS, you wouldn't have a cell phone or an ATM machine or TomTom -Tom or Waze or whatever the hell else you drive around town. Just GPS is worth trillions of dollars a year in economic growth because people use it to do cool stuff. It's free, it's like oxygen. So whatever the Space Force is or does, it has to protect our national interest in space. So we'll move out as fast as we possibly can. We have a proposal on the president's desk right now to, to establish a US unified combatant command for space that will be responsible for the defense and, and management of our space architecture. Thanks for the question. Let me give one closing comment, and it's a challenge to all of you. To those of you who wear senior rank, your job is to make everybody else in your organization successful. It's not to be the commander or be popular, it's to make them successful. To get them the resources they need to do the job that is theirs to do. To senior NCOs, you find yourself in the same place. Our senior non-commissioned officers lead our Air Force. Help your airmen be great airmen. And to the young airmen in this audience, don't accept the world as it is. If you see something that can be done better, raise it up the chain of command and get it done, and get it done better. Winston Churchill said, all of us have a special talent, something to which we are uniquely qualified. Wouldn't it be tragic if when fate tapped us on the shoulder for what might have been our finest hour, we find ourselves unprepared or unwilling? Don't accept the world as it is. It's your job to make it better. So to all three of those groups, commanders, lead. Empower your airmen. Senior NCOs, lead. Empower your airmen. Your jobs are to make them successful. And to all of our young airmen, make the world a better place. God bless you all. Thanks.